Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. Here is a glitch in the Matrix story that a Paranormality Magazine reader sent in in December of 2022. Time Slip Witnessed by a Family of Four I've had plenty of time slips in my life. You know, times where the beginning and end are way further apart than the middle can account for. Like a 10-minute walk taking four hours, that sort of thing. I've kept them to myself because, well, I was the only witness, and if we're speculating on something supernatural versus me just being crazy, well, I don't like my odds. This is different, though. This is multiple witnesses, same story. It was New Year's Eve. My husband, two kids, 13 and 9, and I were staying in a motel. We planned to watch the fireworks from the balcony at midnight because we were in city center and they'd be all around us, but that was hours away. The sun had just set and the sky was a misty purple. I was making dinner, sliders, which at that point were 20 minutes from done, as I was setting up our plates, we started hearing fireworks. I checked my phone for the time. It was a little after seven. The fireworks kept going off in the distance, and the kids were getting excited. They went out on the balcony to look and asked me to come out. I kept assuring them they were cool, but the real show started at midnight. I started to wonder myself after a while, though. The fireworks just kept going, more rapid than I expected for seven in the evening. I went outside and saw bursts of color exploding all over the sky. I marveled at it. If this was seven, what would midnight look like? Then I checked my phone again. It was 12.15. I couldn't even tell you what I did after that. I was initially disappointed along with the kids and confused along with the kids, but the more we thought about it, the weirder it seemed. We'd all witnessed the sun setting literally an hour earlier. I'd started dinner while it was still light out, and it was still hot and just barely ready. I'd checked the time and did the math for them how long it would be while the sky was still purple and the fireworks just kept going. It went from seven to midnight in a few minutes. I don't even have a wrap-up for this. I don't know what to say. I'd blame it on my phone, like the clock being off, but that can't explain midnight right after sunset. We're in Utah, not the Arctic Circle. Husband works overnight, so he's used to time feeling weird, and that's what he chalked it up to. Son took it in stride, because he's young and time travel is his jam. Daughter and I are the ones wondering years later WTF happened. She'll bring it up whenever there's a special occasion and I'm cooking like neither of us can trust when something should be done anymore. We both wait on events like we might miss it, because we know we already have before. One of the strangest mysteries in the mountains of West Virginia is the tragic story of the Sauter family. Brandon Wills from Paranormality Magazine asks the question, what happened to the Sauter children? On Christmas Eve, 1945, a fire broke out at the Sauter family home in Fayetteville around 1.30 a.m. Five of their nine children disappeared without a trace during all the commotion. The parents, George and Jenny Sauter, were startled in the middle of the night by what they said was the sound of breaking glass. Then they smelled the smoke and fire starting. They rushed downstairs to investigate 
and found that the fire had begun in the basement and was spreading upward at a rapid speed. The parents managed to rouse their children and get them out of the home but found five missing. George tried to rush back inside, but the fire was too intense. The fire department arrived soon after, but the house was destroyed. After clearing the scene, the bodies of the children were not found. The FBI also investigated, but turned up nothing as well. On December 29, 1945, the local paper, the Fayette Tribune, published an article about the incident. They quote Sheriff George W. Patterson saying, I believe the children perished in the fire. However, the search will continue until all hope is lost. The Sauter family also tried their best and even offered a $5,000 reward for any leads to the children's whereabouts. Posters with their pictures were placed all over town and billboards across the state. Despite all of this, no substantial leads were ever found. There were multiple theories about what happened from various investigations. Jenny Sauter said, I know my children are alive somewhere. I will never give up hope of finding them. Throughout the years, more leads have come up, but were dead ends. In 1967, Jenny Sauter received a letter with a photo of a young man who looked like Lewis Sauter, one of their missing children. The letter was postmarked from Kentucky, but did not have a return address. On the back of the photo was a message, Lewis Sauter, I love Brother Frankie. I still hope to hear from my mother, dad, sisters, and brothers. I have a family in Centralia, Illinois. The Centralia Police Department tried to locate anyone by that name, but could not. Jenny also attempted to send a letter to the return address, but never received anything back. Another witness claimed to have seen a car speed away from the house before the fire began. It was said to be a black sedan, and multiple people were seen inside it. Police looked into this but concluded it may have just been a car driving by. The Sauter family also had a dog named Buster who was not home that night. He was found wandering around town and appeared to be very upset. Most of the theories about what happened to the children have either been debunked or lack any substance. The most popular theory is they were kidnapped, but nothing concrete has been proven. There's also the possibility they just happened to run away the night of the fire, but this doesn't seem likely since it was midwinter then and the parents said they could find no evidence that they'd been planning to do so and all their belongings were left behind. It's also not possible they died in the fire because no remains were found, and the fire didn't reach the second floor where their bedroom was located. The truth about what may have happened to the Sauter children may never be solved. This story has been featured on numerous TV shows and documentaries over the years, yet none have turned up as adults to say, I'm alive. In my opinion, it's more likely that something nefarious was going on that has yet to be uncovered. What do you think happened? To the Sauter children. Creatures of Cryptozoology, the, Mon the Mongolian Death Worm, file number 342. Description As enigmatic as it is ubiquitously believed in within its native region, this vermicular varmint was once described by Mongolian Prime Minister Damzibar thus. It is shaped like a sa sausage about two feet long, has no head nor leg, and it, and it is so poisonous that merely to touch it means instant death. It lives in the most desolate parts of the Gobidi Desert. According to Mongolian legend, the creature travels underground, creating waves of sand on the surface which allows it to be detected. It is supposedly capable of killing at a distance either by spraying venom at its prey or by means of electric discharge. Length, 2 to 3 feet. Weight, 8, 80 to 160 pounds. Color, brown-red. Location, western and or southern Gobi Desi Desert. Investigations. In 1990 and 1992, Ivan Mackerley led small groups of companions into the Gobi Desert to search for the worm. 
inspired by Frank Herbert's novel Dune, in which giant fictional sandworms could be brought to the surface by rhythmic thumping, Mackerley constructed a motor-driven thumper and even used small explosions to try to find it. In 2005, Zoological journalist Richard Freeman of the Center for Fortean Zoology mounted into an expedition to hunt for the death worm, but came up empty-handed. Freeman's conclusion was that the tales of the worm's powers had to be apocryphal, and that reported sightings likely involved an unknown species of worm lizard or amphispana. A New Zealand television entertainment reporter, David Ferrier of TV3 News, took part in an expedition in August 2009, but came up empty-handed as well. He conducted interviews with locals claiming to have seen the worm and mentioned on his website that the sightings peaked in the 1950s. Find more creatures of cryptozoology in Paranormality Magazine. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com paranormalitymag.com Michaela Ford brings us a personal story from her own past called Zombies in Bradshaw. As a child, I lived in the town of Halifax in the county of West Yorkshire, which is in the north of England and where my story is set. I had a paranormal experience which was pivotal to the start of my interest in all things otherworldly. I guess you could call it my origin story. It goes like this. I must have been about eight years old when we saw them. We were at school, playing out in the playground when it happened. There had always been a rumor about so-called zombies that wandered around the old derelict house in the middle of the field near school. In our minds, however, these monsters were not anything like the traditional idea of zombies, but somewhere nearer to a type of grin reaper or hooded monk. Children in the village would whisper about them walking around in their hooded black cloaks, chasing the cows and eating them. To be honest, it sounded unlikely to me even then, and I really had no idea what a zombie would look like, even if I met one. However, I was small and it was exciting to continue the tradition of scaring each other to death in the playground at school. Bradshaw, our small village in the heart of Yorkshire Dales, was rife with mysterious stories of haunted houses and strange happenings. The hillsides were peppered with old, derelict houses and mills, crumbling away into the ground, making exciting and dangerous playgrounds for us to explore. We'd dare each other to go into darkened, wind-whistling rooms and scare each other with tales of dead babies being found half-eaten by werewolves, all the while brave yet terrified. There just so happened to be one of these derelict houses within sight of our school field, and on this particular day the weather was fair. It was winter, I think, but windy, and we were all chasing around in the playground as usual. Suddenly, one child shouted out above the rest, Zombie! Zombie! I can see a zombie! A huge group of us raced over to where the kid was pointing. There! There it is! Oh, there are three of them! She squealed excitedly. 
We all followed her eagerly pointing finger, across the school field, over the next, and into a long field which sloped gradually upwards toward the hill where the haunted house was. As I looked, I blinked in disbelief. There, in the middle of the long field, were three black figures in long cloaks, moving slowly behind a herd of cows. The figures were dressed like reapers, each holding a long wooden staff, their faces hidden from view under their long dark hoods. The cows did not seem to be afraid, but wandered unconcerned up the hill as the zombies herded them slowly in the direction of the house. Myself and the other children were going crazy, jumping, shrieking, and pointing at the figures. The midday meal's supervisors looked very confused and worried as they tried to contain the hysterical mob. The one thing that really stuck in my mind was that the adults could not see the figures. I do remember asking if I could go over to the other side of the school field to get a better look. I was sharply told no, and, as I was an obedient child, did as I was told. However, I longed to get closer, to see properly what these creatures were and what their faces looked like. Soon we were all hastily ushered inside as we were so overexcited and break time was ended early. I reluctantly walked towards my classroom, keeping my eye on the figures all the way back until I got inside. I was desperate to carry on watching the zombies from the window, but unfortunately, we couldn't see into the field properly from the classroom, and as I pressed my nose against the glass, straining to see around corners, I knew I would never forget this day for the rest of my life. I didn't understand what we had seen, but surely twenty children couldn't be wrong. As I grew up, the events of that day were put firmly to the back of my mind, and it wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties that the memory of the zombies would return to haunt me. One Sunday, my friend Dee and I were walking back from my house when she suggested we go to have a cup of tea with her friend Alice. Dee told me that Alice's dad owned the village farm shop. We trooped up the hill to the farm, and Dee led us through the farmyard to two small apartments built next to each other at the edge of a long field next to the school where I had attended. Alice's dad had built them for her and her brother so that they could have their own space when they were teenagers. Alice answered the door immediately and led us into the small apartment. While she made us a cup of tea, I rifled through her book collection and spotted the book Marabou Stork Nightmares, which I'd always wanted to read. Alice kindly said that I could borrow her copy. As we stood in her kitchen, chatting, we gazed out onto the field, talking about nightmares ghosts and such like. Alice told us that she believed in ghosts and how her dad had always encouraged her to trust her instincts, not stifling her imagination as a child. Looking out of the window, I realized that Alice's flat was built right at the top end of the field which had played out such a disturbing scene in front of me all those years ago. Feeling slightly embarrassed, I told Alice about the so-called group hallucination my friends and I had in the school playground, describing the figures with their black hooded cloaks and wooden staffs, herding the cows to their death. Without a flinch, Alice looked at me straight in the eye and said, oh, yes, I see them all the time. Talk about a moment where your blood runs cold. I've never forgotten that moment. It's etched on my memory forever. Having since done further research on the hooded figures, I believe that what I saw are the Genai Cuculati, which are said to be guardians of the land, fertility, and children. They were worshipped by common folk in Celtic Britain and France. The reason they are said to wear the hoods is to shroud themselves from the eyes of those who do not possess the knowledge to truly understand their ritual power. Who knows? Maybe I'll be lucky enough to see them again one day. I'd like that. Nick Valenzuela brings us a few nautical nightmares of Northern California. 
A bucket list item for all visitors to California is to drive along the scenic coastline and marvel at the spectacular views. The drive is one I encourage all to experience. Being a native of Northern California, I have driven the coastline up here multiple times, and something has always stuck out to me. It is riddled with some spooky places. Let's take a drive starting from the northernmost corner of the state down to the edge where SoCal begins to take over. These are the nautical nightmares of Northern California. The Battery Point Lighthouse The Battery Point Lighthouse was commissioned on December 10, 1856. It's one of the largest serving lighthouses in all of California. An eerie element to the lighthouse is the road that leads to the lighthouse can only be accessed via a road that only exists at low tide. When the tide is high, the lighthouse becomes an island, isolated and alone from the town of Crescent City. The lighthouse survived a catastrophic tsunami that occurred in 1964 that destroyed much of the town. This destruction has influenced some to believe that the lost souls of the tsunami find their way to the lighthouse. Like a beacon calling out to the dead, paranormal investigators who spent time at the lighthouse attest to the hauntings. Pay the Battery Point Lighthouse a visit, just make sure you can get back before high tide. The Delta King The Delta King Riverboat Hotel in Sacramento, California takes guests back to another time, and so do the ghosts. The riverboat was used in World War II by the Navy and shuttled passengers from San Francisco to Sacramento prior to that, yet it was left for scraps. Luckily, in 1984, it was restored and turned into a hotel, restaurant, and theater. However, it seems the ship has kept a few permanent passengers over the years. There are claims that the ship is still haunted by its original captain who frequents the theater. A ghostly girl bouncing a ball is seen on the deck of the ship. Her giggling can sometimes be heard. Even some poltergeist activity is reported on the boat, with glasses and objects falling over or being flung about. The Golden Gate Bridge The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is certainly an area of high strangeness. In 1853, the SS Tennessee sank due to the nefarious Golden Gate Current. Decades later, in 1942, members of the USS Kennison saw this same ship sail past them near the bridge in full flying Dutchman form. The Golden Gate Bridge is also one of the only hotspots for UFO sightings in the city, according to the National UFO Reporting Center. There have even been a few recent reports of a sea monster near the bridge, which locals have dubbed Sassy. Hauntings, UFOs, and cryptids all seem to love the Golden Gate Bridge just as much as the rest of us. The Moss Beach Distillery Built in 1927, the Moss Beach Distillery was originally called Frank's Place, named after Portuguese immigrant Frank Torres. The location soon took off as a speakeasy. Its secluded location and foggy setting was perfect for smuggling alcohol and rejoicing in revelry. Frank's establishment was a wild good time, which certainly led to some wild moments. Now, these moments may still have an imprint on the restaurant to this day. It all started with passionate matters of the heart. Legend has it that a young married woman who fancied herself in a blue dress fell in love with a dashing piano man who could tickle the ivories with the best of them. They carried out a passionate love affair only to have it end in death and mayhem. When the husband found out, he confronted his wife and the piano man. The incident ended in the woman dying via the altercation. Some versions have the piano man dying as well. Others have him escaping. Some versions skip this whole incident altogether, and the woman died in a car accident going to see her beloved piano man. And yet, one more version has the piano man two-timing the married woman and involves a second woman throwing herself off the cliff's edge at Frank's place after finding out about all the seaside passion that was going on. One thing that is certain is, after all of this, a ghostly woman who fancied herself in a blue dress started appearing at Frank's Place, which is now the Moss Beach Distillery, and the legendary haunt of the Blue Lady began. 
The blue lady has been spotted at the bar, causing a raucous with mischievous-like behavior. Her spirit has been reported by the staff and the patrons at the restaurant for decades. She has always been known to be friendly, but she still puts a scare in those fearful of the beyond. Pay a visit to the Moss Beach Distillery for spirits, views, and the spirits. Tour House One of the most scenic, picturesque, and beautiful homes in all of California may still be home to the spirit of the famous poet who built it. Robinson Jeffers, a noted poet of the early 20th century famous for his epic form poetry, built himself a home that tells a narrative all its own. Jeffers built Tor House, termed for the geological formation of a rock outcrop. Tor House rises along the Carmel-by-the-Sea coastline like a castle constructed by Mother Nature. Complementing the property is Hawk Tower, where it is said that Jeffers' wife, Una, would hold seances at the top of the tower. Not a far-fetched idea, considering spiritualism was a popular belief during the heyday of Robinson and Una. In Jeffers' poem, Ghost, he spoke of coming back to his home 50 years after his death as a spirit. Many docents and staff at Tour House still feel the presence of Mr. and Mrs. Jeffers. The upstairs docent's office is said to be a hot spot for phantom activity. Robinson has been seen peering out the window of the main house. Robinson also kept an actual human skull in this part of the home that is still there to this day. Could these physical remains be a source of paranormal activity? Una is also seen often roaming Hawk Tower where she would often spend much of her time. Carmel-by-the-Sea is one of California's most breathtaking towns. Be sure to make it a stop during your visit to California, and certainly visit Tor House to step foot in the life of a literary great and the majestically mystical place he and his family may still call home. And then there is the Dark Watchers. The Dark Watchers are shadowy humanoid figures that have been seen in the Santa Lucia mountain range of Central California for hundreds of years. They usually appear at dusk or dawn, silhouetting against the merging night sky. Noted literary greats and Monterey County residents Robinson Jeffers and John Steinbeck both wrote of the Dark Watchers. In Jeffers' poem, Such Counsels You Gave to Me, he described the Dark Watchers as forms that look human but certainly are not human. Steinbeck mentioned the Watchers in his short story, Flight, and his son Thomas wrote a book on the mysterious figures called In Search of the Dark Watchers. Explanations for the Watchers range from mountain specter illusions to ultra-terrestrial beings. No one is quite sure where they come from or why they are here. Now a part of the storied folklore of Monterey County and much of the California coastline, the Dark Watchers remain shadowy guardians of the Santa Lucia mountain range. Whether these shadowy figures are ghostly, interdimensional, ultra-terrestrial, or Brocken specter illusions, they will remain an ominous mystery. We made it to our destination safely, but we may have picked up a few phantom hitchhikers along the way. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is ParanormalityMag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.